Jared here. All right, yes. Um, happy Friday. It's a uh, week five Friday, and I know it's a Friday evening, but uh, yes, thank you for being here. And, uh, and so today's lecture uh, is going to be uh, a little bit different. Uh, I got a couple things I want to talk about. And so one comes from the, uh, the textbook. And, um, and where is it? Um, let's see. Okay, so I don't actually, I, do not, I don't have lecture slides today, but, uh, but I think that's okay. All right, so, um, so one part comes from the textbook and I'll just write a brief thing. All right, so this is uh, section 2.11 from the textbook. It's on variability in predictions, okay? Variability in predictions. And it talks, so we talked about, so on Wednesday, we talked about kind of uh, Fisher information and it's the idea of how much, how confident are we in the estimators that we've predicted, right? Or estimators that we've inferred from our data, right? So we've estimated, you know, the slope, we've estimated the intercept and things like that. And on Wednesday, we talked about the Fisher information and we said, you know, if it's, it's gonna be kind of the, um, the expectation of these, you know, second derivative of the log likelihood function, actually the negative expectation of that. And, and basically we said, you know, if you look at the second derivative, the second derivative measures curvature, you know, for a univariate function, it measures curvature. And if you talk about the equivalent of a second derivative in a higher dimensional space, it's also measuring curvature, except it, it's this Hessian matrix, okay? It's, uh, it's the uh, matrix of partial derivatives of your gradient. And so you have the Hessian matrix, which is kind of like your second derivative. And that too measures curvature. And basically we're saying if something has high curvature, then we can be more confident in the, uh, the estimate. And if it has less curvature, then that's gonna be a little bit more spread out. We're gonna have less kind of less confidence, there's more, more variation as far as it goes uh, in the, um, the estimates that, that we're estimating, okay? And, uh, and so in our textbook, there's, a, there's another section, 2.11, which talks about the variability in predictions, okay? And the idea here is that, you know, your, um, your new prediction, okay, so your T sub new, Is going to be equal to um, the your estimated um, your estimated coefficients, which will be um, okay. So your estimated coefficients um, times your uh, Your, your, new, um, your new X value, right? So you have a, so you've created some kind of um, model. You have now a new observation at X new, and then your prediction for it is going to be uh, basically your, your current um, uh, estimated coefficients times that, okay? And so, um, if you read through 211, and I, I decided to kind of just <laughs> skip through it, and they, they, go, um, they go through all of the work, but it basically comes down to that, uh, that your, new, your new value is going to be this, okay? And the variation um, is going to be equal to uh, this quantity here, okay? So the... Um, So the, um, the variation is going to be um, the, the variance of just kind of how much noise there is in the data, okay, multiplied by your, X, your new x value, okay. Uh, your new x value times that, but also 
also this quantity here. X transpose X. Don't worry about this. Okay. All right. So this is this is going to be the result here. Okay. We've got sigma squared X trans uh, X transpose X new X transpose X inverse times X new. Okay. All right. So what? Let I just want to kind of uh, focus on this and and maybe just do some examples because I think uh, some examples will help make a little bit more intuitive sense out of what all of this means, okay? And I'm gonna just kind of start by drawing a few pictures here. So let me, um, let me fix my map in here. All right, so the idea here is how, how confident or how much variation is there going to be in an S in, in our estimate here? Okay. And I think all of this just kind of th this makes sense if you um, if you picture it. And then all this does is it just kind of shows, you know, mathematically it also lines up as well. Okay. So let's say this is um, the data. Okay. Your data comes here and here. Okay. So you've got you've got some data points like this. And we want to, and we're going to fit a linear model. Okay, so fit a linear model. And um, so my line of best fit might look something like this. I don't know. Okay, and, and we, you know, we want to kind of take into account that, um, that there's going to be variation. All right, and then we're going to say, let's say we make a prediction right here, okay? All right, so this is, this is going to be x new, okay? So right now, our training data x, you know, consists of, you know, points like 1, 0, 1, uh, maybe, maybe I'll do, um, yeah, one, one, like I will say I've got data at one, two, 99, 100 or something like that. Okay. All right. And then X new is at 50. Okay. And the thing here is it actually, it doesn't really matter what our Y points are, okay? Like there's gonna be some noise here, right? There's noise. So depending on, um, depending on our random sample of data, maybe uh, Y ends up up here or Y ends up down here, Y ends up up here, Y ends up down here, right? There's, there's gonna be some noise. So if, if we're just taking values around one and two, you know, there's gonna be some kind of range of values. And, you know, as far as like what kind of lines I might fit, okay? You know, at, at best, okay, you know, we'll get a little bit of variation here. And I might get some, uh, right, if I fit, if I take random samples of data and I try to fit um, different uh, samples of data or uh, different kind of linear models to it, you know, th this might be a selection of some of the lines that might fit. Does that kind of make sense as far as uh, what this picture is trying to show? All right, so then we say, well, how much variation is there in my prediction? Would, and would you say there's a lot of variation or not that much? Okay. In this case, I would say there's not that much variation. So as far as variation in the prediction goes, um, there's not much in, um, not much variation in, this, in the prediction for x nu. We'll, we'll have that, okay? Contrast this, okay? Contrast this scenario where I'm getting data at one, two, 99, 100, 
and I'm making a prediction at around 50, contrast that um, to something where um, um, I'm going to have four data points. And my data points will be at one, two, three, and four. Okay. And I've got some, you know, data points here. And I'm going to try to make a prediction out at 100. Okay. And, and we know that you should never do this, right? We know that, you know, if you only collected data from one through four, to try to extrapolate out to 100 is a bad idea. Okay. And it's a bad idea for many reasons. But one in particular is that the amount of variation, okay, because again, there's our, our data points here are subject to random noise, okay, and so depending on the data that we get, okay, so you imagine there's some kind of cloud of data points here, okay, and we fit some linear models to this, okay, we might fit a line, straight lines, okay, so one line could look like this. Um, and another line, depending on the cloud of points, could look like that. Another line could look like that. Another line could, you know, just kind of depending on whatever whatever data we have. Okay, and so how much variation is there for this? This this being my x new. Okay, so if my uh, training data x, let's say, is equal to um, one, uh, one, 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 and we got uh, in our case, well, I did uh, one, two, three, four, and uh, x new is equal to one hundred. You know how much how much variation is here? There's there's a lot. Okay, a very high um, variation here. in the uh, predictions. Okay. And so that gets captured, okay? Whether there's high variation or low variation in your prediction, the prediction for your your um, the the variance in your prediction, that variation gets captured in basically what values you have in your x. Okay, all right. So what values you have in your x is going to kind of get um, you'll you'll get a measure of some kind of variance in x here by doing x transpose x. It's it's, um, it's not exactly the variance because it's not centered, but um, you get you get some kind of measure of like the values that show up in, in x. And when you multiply it against x new, it'll also give you it'll give you Kind of a sense of where, um, whether you can speak to areas out here, right? So if, if all of your data is over here in one, two, three, four, and you're trying to make a prediction here, you know, how confident can you be in your prediction? You can't be very confident because, you know, it could be all over the place here, right? This is this is kind of a, a huge range. You know, compare that to the uh, the previous slide. And let me just kind of. Let's see. Save this in the wrong spot. Save the copy in. No, that's what I want. All right. So, you know, compare that to the previous version or the previous picture that I drew where. You know, you have data um, out at you know ninety nine, one hundred, and one and two, and you're trying, you're picking a value in between. You actually have uh, a good sense of what what it could be, and uh, and whereas if you're pr predicting over here, and so that that's going to get captured, okay. And then similarly, if you did something the opposite, where you have values up at say like ninety nine, one hundred, one hundred one, one hundred two. And then you're trying to make a prediction down at one or two, then um, 
then you're not able to uh, make a good prediction, okay? And so here, um, the, uh, the formula for it is sigma squared x, x nu transpose x transpose x inverse x nu. And, um, um, and so for in all of these cases, uh, it's a lot, as far as the effect of x goes, it's gonna be this part, x nu transpose x transpose x inverse x nu. And we're gonna just put in sigma squared here, okay? And so of course, I, I think this part is intuitive. Whereas, you know, if there's lots of noise in the population, then uh, you'll have more variance or more unpredictability. And if there's very little noise uh, in the population, you'll have less variance here. So, uh, but I wanted to kind of focus on the effect of the X that you have in your data and where your X nu is, and just kind of talk about that. And so here I have just a, a couple of these examples. So this first one, you know, as far as a, a linear model goes with a, an intercept and a slope, my X, uh, this is supposed to be kind of like this. I have slightly different numbers where I have, you know, uh, an observation at zero and one and an observation zero, one, 100 and 101. And my new observation is at 50, okay? And we wanna talk, see, you know, how much variation will I have, right? So, you know, let's just assume sigma squared is equal to one, okay? Then the kind of the uh, variation in prediction would be low, right? So if I plug in X and if I say my X nu is located at 50, you know, how much uh, variation do I have? This number comes out to be around 0 0.25. Okay. So a, a small amount, okay? As far as, you know, the, uh, the, the factor that goes in here, okay? Uh, over here, this is kind of the flip side where I have observations, uh, I think in my matrix, I put in 0, 1, 2, 3, or here I have 1, 2, 3, 4, and we're going to try to make a prediction at 100, right? And so if I do this, does this kind of make sense as far as the, the data that I'm putting, as far as my x goes? So my x has, you know, um, ones for the, uh, the intercept term and for the kind of estimating the slope, and we're going to end up using that in our prediction, we've got 0, 1, 2, 3, and the matrix is 1, uh, 1 comma 100 for the, the new observation. I'm going to predict all the way at 100. And we can see, all right, if I use the same thing, x, x new transpose, x transpose x inverse times x new, okay? This, this number is way huge at 1,940, okay? Compare that to 0.25, this number is absolutely huge, right? 1940.7, so variation. Right? All right, and that, and basically that this is just kind of, numerically showing what what we can see intuitively from the picture right if you're if you're trying to predict out at 100 based on data points over here it's going to be wild right if you're trying to predict something in between here there's not going to be a ton of variation okay if i do the just kind of the opposite or i say all right let's predict um let's say we've gathered data at 97 98 99 100 out here but we want to make a prediction at zero Okay, how far off are we going to be? Again, we're off by the same amount, right? Uh, 1940.7, right? And so this, so this again, uh, a huge, huge amount here. Okay, so tr trying to predict something. And, you know, if I, if I wanted to just show like, okay, predicting out at zero is way off, right? But if I say, all right, we're going to predict at 100, which kind of makes sense. Here I'm at 97, 98, 99, 100. If I'm going to try to predict at 100, okay? the amount of variation is way small. And then the farther I get away from basically the middle of my data, right? So the, the smallest is gonna be at 98.5. Okay, that's gonna be the smallest. That's the smallest amount of variation. But if I go, the farther I get away from the middle of my data where I've collected data, so if I venture down to say 90, um, uh, it gets bigger. If I venture down to 80, it gets bigger. If I venture down to 50, it gets even bigger. And, you know, as I, as I get to, you know, farther away from that center, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? And if I go in the kind of the opposite direction, I go out to 200, that's also going to be wildly off. If I go out to 1,000, which is even farther away from 98, you know, <laughs> the amount of variation at this point is 
is is again wildly off right and and it's going to be minimized when i'm talking about like kind of right at the center of my data the amount of variation that i have is going to be as small as possible which makes sense i think intuitively right okay so that's what we have right um i want to show um just also what what effect will we have if for a linear model okay And I just want to show, you know, what what difference will it make if um, if this is one data set and here's another data set, okay? And um, and here I have zero, one, fifty, and one hundred. All right, I'm sorry, I've got zero. I got zero, one hundred. 101, and then I got 50 in between. And then here I've got 0, 100, 101, okay? And 50 in between. All right, and so in, in one set, we're gonna fit a linear model and we're gonna pretend we've got some data here, okay? And again, we, all, of our, um, all of our data is subject to noise, okay? And so, you know, as far as the observed data goes, it can, you know, it could be, higher or lower, higher or lower, higher or lower. But we're gonna fit some, you know, the actual values here. I just wanna see kind of the effect of X on the thing, right? Okay, as far as our predictions for what X, X new, so X new is gonna be at 50. Okay, is there gonna be much very difference as far as the variation of the predictions that we're gonna have here? Okay. In one case, I'm including an observation at 50. And in another case, I don't have an observation at 50. Okay. We're fitting a linear model. We've got an observation at 0, 100, 101, 0, 50, 100, 101. And over here, I have 0, 100, and 101. Right? So here, I only have three data points. Over here, I have four data points. And I have an observation at 50. Okay. So the answer is, is if we're assuming that it's a linear model, Okay, the resulting models that we have, they're not gonna be all that different, okay? You know, as far as, yeah, we might get um, some, you know, a slightly different slope or a slightly different intercept, but, but pretty much all of the different models that we're gonna fit are gonna look pretty, uh, pretty similar to each other, okay? So, you know, from random noise, you know, we might get something a little steeper, a little more shallow, something like that, okay? And, um, and it doesn't really make a huge difference if I'm missing a, an observation at point 50, okay? Uh, for, for a linear model, um, even if I remove the data point, it's not gonna make a huge difference as far as the variation goes, okay? So if I plug in here with X, here I have the observation at 50, and then I say, I'm gonna make a prediction at a new point, at 50, okay? How much variation is there? It's not a big number, 0 0.273, okay? Over here, I have zero, um, I remove the observation at 50, okay? And I'm gonna say, I wanna make a prediction at 50. How much um, variation is there in the prediction? You know, it's a little bit bigger. I only have um, three observations here. And so, you know, I'm a little bit less confident in my um, kind of, coefficient estimates and therefore my prediction estimates um, will have a little bit more uh, variation there, but it's not dramatically different right here I'm at, you know, they're both less than one, both less than 0.5, you know, whereas before when we're trying to predict, you know, somewhere far off, we're getting these ridiculously huge numbers. Okay. Uh, and over here, the number, you know, it's a little bit bigger, but not, not wildly off. Okay. And that kind of makes sense because, you know, as far as a linear model goes, there's not like, much flexibility with a straight line. Okay, so with a straight line, um, if you kind of have like where the the endpoint on this side is supposed to be and where the endpoint is supposed to be on this side, you know what what happens in the middle? There's not a whole lot of flexibility there. Okay. Um, but what happens if I make my model a little bit more complicated? Oh, you know what? Before I keep get go there, let me. Um, give you your first view quiz answer. First view quiz answer today is E. 
E as in elephant. E as in elephant is your first view quiz answer. Okay, what would happen though, if I decide instead of a linear model, I decide to fit like a polynomial model? Okay, so over here, I'm gonna have all right. So over here, I have an observation at zero. We're gonna have an observation at fifty, observations at one hundred and one hundred one. Okay, and here we have an observation at zero, observation at one hundred, an observation at one hundred one. Okay, so with a polynomial model. Let's say I'm going to do a quadratic model. So, so my data, my in, input data is going to be 100 zero, zero squared, 150, 50 squared, 1, 100, 100 squared, 1, 101, and 101 squared. And over here, I'm going to remove the point at 50. And uh, I have 100 zero, zero squared, 1, 100, 100 squared, and 1, 101, 101 squared. Okay. So that's going to be kind of my quadratic model. And the question is, does it make a big difference if I do or do not include a point at 50? Okay. And so the answer is it makes a very big difference if I have a point at 50 or if I don't have a point at 50, right? So you can imagine I have some data and let's say I've got some noise here, okay? So let's say um, uh, this is kind of what we have and, you know, I. I have some, uh, we'll, we'll put in some noise uh, around here and we might, we might go higher or lower, higher or lower. But if I, if I have kind of a, a point in between the endpoints, 0, 100, 101, if I have something around here, this will really shape what kind of, uh, what kind of parabolas I can kind of fit in here, right? Um, I don't know how to draw smooth, smooth things out. <laughs> okay. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to make a prediction out here or something, okay, this, this having an observation here is going to kind of form like a little anchor and it's going to really tie down um, ground where the, um, where the parabola can go. Okay. Whereas over here, if I have uh, an observation here, and I've got an observation here and here, and we've got some noise, All right? We've got some noise here, we've got some noise here, we've got some noise here. Then there's all kinds of parabolas that I can fit, right? So as far as parabolas that could be fit, I could end up having something that looks like that. That could kind of fit our data. We could have something that looks like that. You could even have, depending on how what what the noise is that comes in, like these all seem like uh, stuff that could possibly work, right? I don't know. Okay, and so as far as trying to make a prediction, right? So if this is x new here, x new is at fifty. Okay. Now, without having an observation at 50 or having an observation in between 0 and 100, um, now we're going to have lots of variance. Okay. All right. Does that kind of make sense? What's happening? All right. And this, and so this gets reflected using that same formula of using, um, you know, uh, x. Trans, x new transpose times x transpose x times x new, right? So this is this is what happens. So here, um, my input matrix x has the observation 0, 50, 100, 101, and then you know it's quadratic, so we're going to have 0 squared, 50 squared, 100 squared, 101 squared. My new observation is going to be at 50, okay? And so how much variance do I have? My variance is on the order of around 1, okay? So not, not too, too, too much, right? Over here, I have an observation at one, 
that's 0, 100, 101. And I got 0 squared, 100 squared, 101 squared. OK, and here we're going to say, all right, my new observation is at 50. And we say, OK, how much variation do I have here? OK, now we have a very, very big number. OK, and we have a very big number, right? And so it's interesting, right, um, that kind of you know what's happening here ends up getting captured in that taking your current x observations and taking um you know x transpose x inverse the you know the um you know what, what do we get when we solve this you know this this information here somehow captures kind of you know it's the relationship that we have between um the, the new observation and whether we are able to um provide information about it, okay, and how confident we can be in that thing, okay? The derivation of it, um, so rather than kind of have a slide full of all sorts of um, equations and whatnot, I decided to just draw a bunch of pictures hoping uh, I could appeal to um, using the pictures to uh, um, kind of give us some intuition. If you want to kind of go through the derivations and see see whatnot, um, it's, it's in the textbook on page 85 of the textbook, and there's a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of stuff as far as you know how how they went about how they arrived at this number okay but uh <clears throat> but anyway i just kind of wanted to go through that and show that there's also um if you go to the textbook website um there's a an r script uh in the in the github r script and i cannot kind of um link to it um where they uh show you basically a picture of how this this works out as well Okay, so here um, they did something. Here's just some fake data, and they intentionally removed a chunk of the data between zero and two. Okay, and then they, they want to see kind of what kind of predictions we can get in this in this area. And so they said, you know, um, if you fit um, a third order polynomial, you've got less variation, and as you actually increase the amount of the the complexity of your polynomial the uh the amount of kind of uncertainty in this area actually increases just because with more flexibility you can end up getting you know wilder things right and then if you try to fit something that does you know clearly is a bad fit like a second order polynomial then then everything is just kind of like wildly off because you know with a quadratic it's like well, what's the kind of the, the proper fit that you're supposed to fit here and it, it, you don't have anything good and with a first order you're just kind of trying to fit some straight lines here, and again, we don't we don't really get a good thing here. Okay, so you got kind of a plot there, and then um, and then here they just kind of randomly generated a series of um, just to kind of give you a sense, right? So here are like different straight lines that they could fit to just different random samples drawn from here, and you know as far as quadratic ones, these are not doing a good job, but third order because I think the original relationship is something around a third order polynomial looks kind of like that and and as you increase and you get something like an eighth order polynomial you know you get a little bit more flexibility around this this area of missing data okay um ooh, all right I'm gonna run out of time but I, I just I also wanted to <laughs> just throw in uh, throw this in here because we are going to encounter the multivariate normal distribution in um, upcoming uh, lectures, and I didn't quite know where to fit this, and uh, and so I'm going to just kind of squeeze it in here, okay? <laughs> um, and so I think you've encountered the multivariate normal um, dis uh, distribution already, but uh, just a, a few reminder slides here. Let me go ahead and give you your second view quiz answer. And then we'll just go through a few of these things. Um, so second view quiz answer today is A, A as an apple, A as an apple. Okay, so, um, so I didn't typeset these, I just kind of wrote these um, out, but I hope my handwriting is okay enough. All right, so the univariate normal distribution, I think we're all familiar with this. Um, I feel like if you're gonna graduate with a degree in statistics, you should have, have at least the univariate normal PDF like sort of memorized, okay? And um, although like if you put me on the spot, I'd probably panic and not be able to give it to you. But <laughs> if, um, but this is something you should 
<clears throat> kind of at least be able to recognize if it, if it shows up in the wild and be like, ah, oh, yes, univariate normal distribution. Okay. But anyway, um, you got this, uh, this thing up here, this acts as kind of a normalizing constant so that when you take the integral of this whole thing, x minus mu squared over uh, sigma squared, um, you know, to, to the negative, it's going to integrate to one, right? Okay, so the multivariate normal is now we've got this vector x, vector x in d dimensions. So this is a d dimensional vector. And we would denote that it's a multivariate normal. Um, you might put a little d uh, subscript here. And in the d dimensions, it's going to come from a, it's going to have a mean vector mu, a d dimensional vector of mean values, and a variance matrix sigma. And this is going to be a d by d. Uh, positive definite variance matrix, okay? And so um, as long as, uh, <clears throat> you know, your, your x values are, have a, aren't completely collinear or something, um, this, this will be positive definite. Okay, and then so the density function of the multivariate normal, you know, has this. Um, it's going to be uh, 1 over square root 2 pi raised to the d power. And then you have the determinant of sigma times e to the, and then negative one half. And now we have x minus mu transpose sigma inverse x minus mu, okay? Now, if you look at this thing up here and this thing down here, there are kind of some similarities, right? x minus mu squared, the vector equivalent of that is kind of like x minus mu transpose x minus mu, right? So x minus mu transpose x minus mu, is a lot like x minus mu squared, but you know you, you're kind of vectorized operations, so you're going to get a sum of, you know, this some of these squared differences. Okay, and then there's no such thing as matrix division, but if you want to divide by sigma squared, you can kind of multiply it by the inverse of sigma. So you have sigma inverse, and that's kind of like dividing by sigma squared here. Okay, over here we have uh, the determinant of sigma inside of here, um, and that's you know, the determinant, you know, of a matrix is kind of this weird idea of it's like, it's the air, like if it's a two dimensional, it's a, if it's a two by two matrix, you've got, it's the um, volume of the parallelogram carved out by the uh, vector column vectors. And then if you um, have a higher dimensional, not higher dimensional, but like a larger matrix, like a three by three or a four by four, you know, it would be the volume of the kind of parallel, uh, parallel pipid, whatever you call this thing, okay, that gets carved out by the, um, by the column vectors of that thing, right? And so you're like, well, what, is, what does that even mean? And what, what role does it even play? Don't worry about it. It just basically serves so that when you take the integral of this whole thing, the whole thing integrates to one, right? Because that's kind of like the requirement of all PDFs is that all PDFs have to integrate to one. So, so this thing is kind of like related to the, uh, I guess the the volume of whatever this part is, right? So this thing will get, you know, possibly bigger or smaller depending on the um, amount of variance that shows up here, and variance and covariance that shows up here, and therefore, um, you know, the adjustment that we ne need to uh, take care of can get can be taken care of through the determinant of sigma. Okay, a high level conceptual idea there. Okay, and so you know, here's here's just a simple example. If you have a diagonal um, variance matrix, in this case, we, we're kind of choosing the simplest. We're going to have a mean vector. Uh, our mean vector is zeros, and my sigma matrix is the identity matrix. Right, so everything basically has a variance of one, and there's no covariance between the terms. Okay, if we plug that into the um, the uh, PDF, okay. The PDF will simplify. You can factor out the PDF into the product of three um, basically um, univariate, um, standard normal univariate uh, normal PDFs, right? So, so with uh, with mean zero, you know, this basically becomes the uh, standard normal um, distribution here. Okay, standard normal, standard normal, all with a uh, mean zero. Um, variance one, okay? And then, you know, you can just kind of um, generalize that to any kind of matrix. Uh, if your um, variance matrix, variance covariance matrix is a diagonal matrix, 
okay? Then the whole thing will also, you can also factor it out, right? Because if you take the, um, if you take the uh, inverse of a diagonal matrix, basically it's, uh, it's a whole bunch of zeros everywhere off diagonal and the diagonal entries are just basically the um, reciprocals of these diagonal entries. Okay, and so the whole thing also factors out. Okay, so all, all to say is that you know the multivariate normal PDF, if it's uh, if it's a product of if the um, the the x variables are independent, you can just express them as a product of normal PDFs. Okay, and that and that makes sense because you know one of the rules of probability is that um, probabilities of independent events is just the product of their probabilities. And so the same thing happens with the normal PDF. If you have independent X variables, it just ends up being the product of their things, okay? Um, on the other hand, if you have um, off diagonal entries that are not zero, meaning that you have covariance, variance of co covariance between um, your X variables, then, um, then you can't express it as some kind of uh, product here. However, uh, one property of the multivariate normal um, distribution is that all of the marginal distributions are, um, are normally dis are going to be normal, right? So here, this is, um, this is going to be a three-dimensional vector, and, uh, and this is a multivariate, and there's um, covariance between x1 and x2, there's covariance between x2 and x3, there's no covariance between x1 and x3. x1 and x3 are uh, independent of each other, okay? But um, if you look at just the distribution of x1 by itself or the distribution of x2 by itself, they themselves, the marginal distributions, are normally distributed, okay? Wikipedia has a nice picture of this. This picture right here. Okay, so this is uh, the multivariate normal distribution of x and y together. X and y together, you know, kind of makes this ellipse. But if you look at y all by itself, okay, y all by itself will be normally distributed. X all by itself will be normally distributed. Okay, and it'd be kind of the idea that, you know, if if this was like sand or something, and you just kind of like tilted the um, tilted this board so all the sand kind of falls but it, exactly in a straight line and they end up getting stacked up they're going to you know stack up into this uh, this thing here okay this normal distribution shape okay so the marginal distributions uh, themselves are normally distributed and then um, and then all of the covariance terms are um, show up here and if you have a zero covariance then that means the, those variables x1 and x3 are going to be independent okay all right, and, and in this case, also, if you take any subset of a, multi, uh, of a vector that has a multivariate normal distribution, any subset itself will also follow the multivariate normal distribution, right? So here I've got x is, uh, is the vector consisting of x1, x2, and x3. And let's say I just decided to pull out variables x1 and x3, okay? Then x1 and x3 itself comes from a normal distribution where the mean is going to be the mean of x1 and mean of x3. So the mean will be 1, 2. And then the uh, variance covariance uh, matrix will be just kind of the subset of the, you know, kind of the, the uh, x, uh, x1 and x3 elements, right? So we're going to have basically the, the 1 and the 3 will be 4, 0, 0, and 9. Okay. So this one, they'll, they'll, they'll be independent, but you can do any kind of subset, if you took out variables x1 and x2, it would just be kind of this top corner here, or x2 and x3, you know, it'd be this, these four values here. All right, and so that's, that's kind of an interesting and, and a handy property of the multivariate normal distribution. Okay, also useful is if you have any linear combination of the values in x, then, um, then the uh, then the kind of the resulting variables themselves will also follow an, a normal distribution here, right? So here um, we're going to say x is some uh, you know comes from a multivariate normal distribution, 
And C is going to be some kind of D by D transformation matrix, non-singular transform, uh, non-singular matrix that represents kind of this linear transformation of X variables, right? So um, then, then if you say Y is the result of taking C multiplied by X, okay, the result is that Y itself is going to come from a normal multivariate normal distribution where the mean is C times the mu vector and the new variance is gonna be C times the variance matrix times C transpose, right? So some, so here's an example, right? So X is gonna have, um, is a two dimensional vector coming from a multivariate normal with mean one, two and variance matrix one, zero, zero, three. And, um, and we're gonna say Y is gonna be um, the very, uh, is, we've got a linear combination of our X terms. So we got X1 and X2 is gonna be Y1 and X1 minus X2 is gonna be Y2, okay? So, you know, what's the distribution of Y1, Y1 plus, or X1 plus X2? What's the distribution of X1 minus X2? Things like that, okay? So we can express Y as uh, basically the product of some matrix C times X, right? So Y is just a linear combination and so, you know, as, as long as you have some kind of linear combination and you're not doing something like squaring the values or things like that, you're just kind of adding them or multiplying them by constants or taking differences between them, then you can express that transformation with basically a, a matrix product here, right? I mean, that's the linear part of linear algebra. And so we have, um, we're gonna say uh, the, the Y for the X1 plus X2 can be expressed as one, one and one, and x1 minus x2 can be one minus one, okay? And so c times x will be x1 plus x2 and x1 minus x2, and we're gonna get y. That's gonna be our y vector. And therefore, the resulting distribution of y is going to be the product of c times our mu vector. So I'm gonna just take this matrix c multiplied by mu, okay? And the result here is gonna be three and negative one, okay? And then, and to get the variance, okay, we would take the product of C times the variance matrix times C transpose, okay, and this is going to end up being the result. We get four uh, minus two minus two and four, okay. And interestingly enough, is that even though x one and x two are independent of each other, okay, now that we have a linear combination of x one and x two and uh, y is x one plus x two and x one minus x two those now have a covariance and they are negative. And, and that makes sense, right? Because uh, we can see that, you know, X1 and X2 and X1 minus X2, they're gonna have, you know, some kind of uh, relationship with each other and, and they're gonna have a kind of a negative relationship as far as, um, as it makes sense, okay? And so, um, you know, and then that gets all captured as far as this goes, all right? Uh, this is a slide just to kind of show the derivation of that, just to kind of show mathematically that, yeah, it kind of makes sense. And I'm not just pulling this out of nowhere, okay? Um, all right, we'll just, we'll just end there. I'll, um, I'll put these together in like a little PDF of handwritten notes and throw that up on, um, uh, online. So, uh, a little bit different today, but, um, but that's it. So we'll, uh, we'll call it an end here. Let me give you your last view quiz answer. Last view quiz answer today is the letter B. B as in bear is your last view quiz answer. All right. So we'll end there. Have, uh, have a good night. Have a good weekend, you guys. And uh, we'll see you guys on Monday.